Okay, that's what we do. 160E. I'm going to assume that you've done this for next time. All right? Yeah. Because if you can do that, then we can talk about it and we can move on a different level. Hmm. <coughs> All things are moving. Yes, I am when I want to be. Don't rub it in. <laughs> okay, I'd like to explore three things, same as we did last time. Three kinds of knowledge. do that, I think we can just confine our attention for a while to the third. Okay, for a while. And these are the questions I'd like to pose. What advantage is there in that kind of knowledge? What advantage is it? Is it essential or non-essential? Huh? Advantage? Essential? Huh? What does it permit, allow? If there is this not. It allows the maximum harvest. And what is what advantage is in that? <coughs> What's the advantage? Greatest amount of fruit. I mean, that would be the goal. Healthiest fruit. Hmm? Healthiest. Why healthiest? Abundant. Continue the line. Oh, why healthiest? Because of the shoe. Because it would be the best. 
What? Because it would be the best soil for the best plant. So we would reach it. If, okay, if best soil, all right, then if you can find what is the best soil for, huh? For the best. What should be sown in any given yeah. soil would allow you then to choose the most. Hmm? No, no. Choose the most appropriate plant that then allow the best of any given combination plants. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> suppose Paul Paul was listening at this point and said what I was thinking he was going to say. <laughs> I'm going to say, and what's the advantage in that? Maximizing yield, and in any okay. case. <laughs> Suppose Paul were persistent and were to say, and so you get a lot of vegetables, so well. So you get a lot of money, you know, because mm -hmm. that's monetary. And again, if he said again. <laughs> you can nourish a lot of people. You can what? Nourish a lot of people. But you can also be getting good food. Well, 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 well. Well, look here. If you're interested in nourishing people, would it be to your advantage then to have an art that maximizes the best possible combination? Sure would. Sure. Maximize the yield, you get the most nourishment. <laughs> Could, doesn't this not presuppose that there may, in fact, have been just as much produced and harvest? Hi. Yeah, my piece of Yeah. Yeah, you are good there. They didn't build it low enough. Well, okay. Want, want to work on the board for a moment? Okay. Up we go. Yeah, do, do, do you work? Okay. Want to stand and do the board? No, sit and do the board? Okay. Yeah. Start them off right on the chair. Like, uh, I'm going to play on this word best, should be. So a lot of things can nourish people. Mm -hmm. What does this implicitly suggest now? Maximize? Bestly yeah. nourished. Yeah. To the bestly. All right, look here. Huh. Now, again, suppose we're to Paul were to persist and say, for what end? For a health of body. Well-being, health of life, mm -hmm. <coughs> bring about well-being. Yeah, that's true. You might go all the way down there. That's what happens sometimes. The soil on the ground just reaches up. What's your mother? Pay heed. Want to give it to your mother? Pay heed. Okay, why don't you give it to your mother? Okay. Stay here, mommy. Can I give it to you? The truck? Here. Oh, I'll hold the truck. Thank you. Can I give it to mom? She was working on how much I'm back. I like the rest of it. Uh, look here, same set of questions. Is there also a knowledge of midwifery described? Again, what advantage? Is it essential or is it non-essential art? Are we on two or are we on one? The healthier yeah. children. Two. Healthier children? That's right. Mm -hmm. Healthier mother children. What else? The best children. Society. He was general. saying you could choose the best parents, right? That's right. 
best parenting we can call them. Uh-huh. Right? And uh, how about relationships themselves? Is that quite hard? Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. Hmm? What? Yeah, it would play a part in uh, well, relationships. Yeah. What advantage is there in that? Well, it would be a part of the whole. Yeah, that's true. Well, it would be what soil the children are going to be brought up in. It would be nurtured. The children would be well nurtured. Mm-hmm. Okay. What is that, nurtured? Is there education? Uh, more than education. Yeah. 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 Guidance is, is Being like, real. Uh, Guidance. <coughs> education. Being real. It's an upholding in almost every area. Hmm. You know, it's a, um, hmm. not, okay. not, be, not, not having right. to take on a mask to survive. Kind of models. Um, <laughs> attending, attending, a constant, you know, a guiding and mm-hmm. and, 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 and but in, att- in attendance. Yeah. Sure. Um, does he also describe in the same art Knowledge of midwifery and a philosophical midwifery. Let's move up one. (coughs) Um, Does he talk about the negatives? Well, he talks about Mm -hmm. abortion in two, aborting. Yeah. The midwife knows when to abort if that's negative. Would he cause pain? In order for what? For why abortion? For this is our. Let's see. If it's desirable, for what? To advantage for what? Probably uh, for the mother. Mm-hmm. All right, for the mother. All right. Say grief. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Have to go through the entire period. All right. Okay. I'll take that. Um, See, I need to know more about. Is there something about drugs and many uses? Of yeah. Again? Yeah, she knows suffering? Allay suffering? And help bring noise, labor. Cooperate with nature? Is that what it is? Cooperate with nature? Bring on, bring on labor when it's needed. Cooperate with nature? Hmm. Is this a three, a well-being that has as its end, it's an essential art, it's an essential because it has as its focus, the well-being of uh, man? Yeah. Man? Mm-hmm. That right? Presupposes? Sure, presupposes mm-hmm. it's not perceived or Take a look at philosophical I'd like to see if we could. I'd like to line up the things that he sees that are positive in respect to it and negatives. I'd like to get both for a moment. Both. We're good. And as much as you know, I'm willing to share a great deal of the work. So if I can get someone. To read uh, Socrates, uh, and then we can assign someone to do the Theotetus. I'll play Theodorus. Yeah, in this part. <laughs> he comes in a little later. That's well. <laughs> <laughs> I volunteered. I didn't realize. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. See what we're after. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. Okay. Fine. I'll be. Okay, Theotetus, we need a sock. We are on 24 or 148. Thank you. Pardon me, 
And uh, as we do it, I'd like to just mention a couple of paragraphs as we go through later. We'll go back to it. Huh? Okay. Do you think, my friend, that there is one art for the sowing and another for the harvesting? 
It is not likely. No, but because there is a wrongful, unscientific way of bringing men and women together, which is called pandering, the midwives, since they are women of dignity and worth, avoid matchmaking through fear of falling under the charge of pandering. And yet the true midwife is the only proper matchmaker. It seems so. So great then is the importance of midwives, but their function is less important than mine. For women do not, like my patients, bring forth at one time real children and at another time mere images, which it is difficult to distinguish from the real. For if they did, the greatest and noblest part of the work of the midwife would be in distinguishing between the real and the false. Do you not think so? Yes, I do. All that is true of their art of midwifery is true also of mine. But mine differs from theirs in being practiced upon <coughs> men, not women, and in tending their souls in labor, not their bodies. <coughs> but the greatest thing about my art is this, that it can test in every way whether the mind of the young man is bringing forth a mere image, an imposter, or a real and genuine offspring. For I have this in common with the midwives. I am sterile in point of wisdom. And the reproach which has often been brought against me that I question others but make no reply myself about anything because I have no wisdom in me is a true reproach. And the reason of it is this, that God compels me to act as midwife but has never allowed me to bring forth. <coughs> I am then not at all a wise person myself nor have I any wisdom, any wise invention, the offspring born of my own soul. But those who associate with me, although at first some of them seem very ignorant, yet as our acquaintance advances, all of them to whom the God is gracious make wonderful progress, not only in their own opinion, but in that of others as well. And it is clear that they do this not because they have ever learned anything from me, but because they have found in themselves many fair things and have brought them forth. But the delivery is due to the God in me. And the proof of it is this. Many before now, being ignorant of this fact and thinking that they were themselves the cause of their success, but despising me, have gone away from me sooner than they ought whether of their own accord or because others persuaded them to do so. Then, after they have gone away, they have just carried this forth on account of evil companionship and the offspring which they had brought forth. Through my assistance, they have reared so badly that they have lost it. They have considered impostures and images of more importance than the truth. And at last it was evident to themselves as well as to others that they were ignorant. One of these was Aristides, the son of Lysimachus, and there are many, and there are very many more. When such men come back and beg me, as they do, with wonderful eagerness to let them join me again, the spiritual monitor that comes to me forbids me to associate with some of them, but allows me to converse with others, and these again make progress. Now those who associate with me are in this matter also like women in childbirth. They are in pain and are full of trouble day and night. <coughs> Much more than are the women. And my art can arouse this pain and cause it to cease. Well, that is what happens to them. But in some cases, the Adidas, who may not seem to me to be exactly pregnant, since I see that they have no need of me, I act with perfect goodwill as matchmaker. And, under God, I guess very successfully with whom they can associate profitably. And I have handed over many of them to Prodicus and many to other wise and inspired men. Now, I have said all this to you at such length, my dear boy, because I suspect that you as yourself believe, are in pain because you are pregnant with something within you. 
Why then to me, remembering that I am the son of a midwife and have myself a midwife's gift, and do your best to answer the questions I ask as I ask them. And if, when I have examined any of the things you say, it should prove that I think it is a mere image and not real, and therefore quietly take it from you and throw it away, do not be angry as women are when they are deprived of their first offspring. For many, my dear friend, before this, have gotten to such a state of mind towards me that they are actually ready to bite me if I take some foolish notion away from them. And they do not believe that I do that in kindness, since they are far from knowing that no God is unkind to mortals, and that I do nothing of this sort from unkindness either and that it is quite out of the question for me to allow an imposture or to destroy the truth. And so, Theotetus, begin again. You try to tell us what knowledge is. And never say that you are unable to do so, for if God wills it and gives you courage, you will be able. That's great. Okay, let me go back. I'd like to know two things. I'd like to know, in the art, in the art of philosophical neglect, What can we say take, would take place without that art? With the art. Okay, come on, whole bunch now, keep going. Proper matchmaking. Uh, oh, for that. Badly reared monster. More? What condition would man be, be in without the art, with the art? Wouldn't be constant. Hmm? Pardon? Pregnant. Uh, well, let's see, you might. Giving Thank birth to a real problem and giving birth kind of to an image? Something else. A problem? Yeah. Give me a bunch of quotes so I can put the writing okay. down. Okay. Just, just go, go mad. The whole, I need a whole bunch of them. Well... <coughs> To arouse the pain and cause it to cease with the art, so without it, um, you'd be left to your own um, You wouldn't have you wouldn't have that. Yeah. yeah, give me some words. Um, you should prove that it is a mere image and not real. And Over here, then, people would accept images. For real? Mm -hmm. And he can also take it away from them and uh, throw it away. And if, if the art of um, philosophical midwifery wasn't there, then maybe these people would want to hold on to their notions. Yeah, yeah, that type, hold on to it, consider it real. Mm -hmm. More. Come on. Hold on. Oh, he can bring it. He can huh? ignorant without test. He tests in every way whether the mind of the young man brings it forth. So what? Uh, what kind of is that? Well, he's able to bring forth mere images and postures or real and genuine offspring. Come on over here. Sure? Gonna go out then? Yeah, come on over. Come on. Yeah, come on. Let's see what's going on. Yeah, come on, help me out. Let me think, my finger? Yeah, you don't need it. Okay, come on. Right. Yeah, but don't touch the machine this time. Okay. That's it? Yeah, 
Yeah, come on. I need more work. What will happen with or without the R? Well, they could miss Gary, it says here, without his help. <coughs> On account of some evil. See, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a whole bunch of things he says would take place without the art, with the art. And with the art, it isn't necessarily all good. Mm -hmm. So I would like that as well. But Certain it, consequences follow. Well, in the example, there's an example of what happens without the art. Yeah, okay. <coughs> when he, when, uh, What's his name? Uh, Aristides left him too soon. Okay. Then what does it presuppose? With that the art, he's got to stay with. Him. He's got to stay with him. Okay. Relate with him. Early leaving. <laughs> it's difficult getting him down. Like again? Like that? True. Never. Okay. Early living, leaving is hazardous. The evil companionship is, uh, causes okay. miscarriage. Okay. All right. All right. That they consider impostures and images no. more important than mm -hmm. the truth. Go ahead. Need more stuff. Say goodbye now. Say goodbye. Say goodbye. Say goodbye. Say goodbye. Say goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. Uh, the, the, judges, uh, with the, art, mm -hmm. the people are in pain, people in trouble. Pain with the art? Mm -hmm. And what can happen with the pain? It can be positive, it can be ceased through his art. Alright, so therefore there's a remedy, right? <coughs> it brings, it's a rem also it's understanding, you understand the pain. Don't you? Right, there's an understanding of it. Is that the remedy for disease? Hmm? Is that the remedy, understanding for disease? The pain? Well, yeah, what happens with Theotetus? Is he in pain? You are suffering the pains of travail? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You puzzled the Oh, body. so why Socrates right. asking? The travail is managed like Okay, good, good. Well, he, he causes and ceases the pain. By the way, if we went back now, let's say we have. A lot of, lot more. We need a lot more. Right, let's assume we have it for a moment. Say, so what's the advantage? And is this an essential art? Well, we could ask what would happen without it. We could ask what's the, what would happen without the knowledge of what unhealthier people? Yeah, unhealthy people for this kind of art, and. Same thing. Souls, well, unhealthy souls. For, uh, for just well, physical midwifery? For physical, it would be a lot less healthier children. And a lot of unnecessary pain and wretchedness of that sort? Mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. And not the best kind of children either. Yeah, yeah. yeah they'd be badly reared. Yeah. Uh, bad parents bad. would not be of the right nature. God, it must be scary having a baby not understanding what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know it's not scary at all. And, and, to have someone, and to have someone helping who doesn't know. Right. <laughs> Which may even be worse than having no one. So, uh, I want to pull something together. Like her. This, this knowledge of midwifery now, <coughs> second phase, how does that relate to the well-being, here was the well-being of man, physical well-being of man. Here, with the art of midwifery, the second category. Does that equally bring about a well-being for man? Mm -hmm. Proper rearing of children, mm -hmm. helping yeah. people yeah. through childbirth and matchmaking and all that. <coughs> okay. Is that equally true up here? Well, then let's say this. Look here. Then what does it give us if 
there is this common thing which runs through all of these arts. Beneficial to man. Right. Well being of man. So in some way then would you agree that you you uh, have to say then, is this a power? Is knowledge a power in each one of these cases? Sure. Yeah. And so too with the other arts. Mm -hmm. These are powers, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Right. Knowledge is a power. But are they power? I mean, it gives them power, but is yeah. it a power? Yeah, that's right. Oh. It provides. It's, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. It allows them to do yeah. things. And does it have to judge between the, the, the abilities of man mm -hmm. in this hierarchy? Mm -hmm. Equally sure. well for this, <laughs> for best nutrition and that? Does that depend upon the particular men and their abilities and their goals and the kind of style of life and the requirements of their nourishment, would that vary too? Mm -hmm. Well then, in some way then, there has to be some grasp both of power and the abilities. Right? The abilities in that. Uh, okay, I just wanted to, to, to uh, <laughs> just go over this just for a short moment. I'm sure it's uh, obvious because now I want to do the second obvious thing. I'm assuming that this you know, and we'll be doing that later. This is presupposed for next week. Mm -hmm. So make sure you know. Uh, I'm taking it off now? Wait, I know. Right. Okay, now. Would you not agree we should not, in principle, spend any time on digressions? No. <laughs> Kang, would you not agree digressions being uh, look at look at David. Digressions are digressions. Yeah, Sandy, digressions <laughs> certainly are a waste of time. What was no. Kim. Mm. I mean it was a di if it's, especially if it's called a digression. Well, well if you're as old as I am, it's easier to follow. In this dialogue, there's a key part. It's called the digression. So now we're just going to skip the digression. Obviously, it has nothing to do with this. It's a digression, and therefore, let's get into the digression. And Barbara will read that section. When you go yeah. up there, you're talking about the power that knowledge has, and then you said the abilities of man. Well, this knowledge, that. this knowledge has the potentiality of a certain power. Knowledge is a certain mm -hmm. power, but like the knowledge of midwifery, depends upon the midwife being able to judge with that knowledge the particular abilities of the person. Okay. It's not the same solution to all problems. Mm -hmm. They have to match with the particular abilities of the individual person. Okay. And have, in the same way though, also have, would you not agree, also have some idea of the natural abilities of women? Even though the particular woman may, may not be aware of it, the midwife somehow know. has to have the idea of what really are the basic qualities and abilities of women in order to call upon them in times of need, crisis. Things like that? Oh, okay. Well, the digression. Let's get out of this digression. I don't know why we're going into this dialogue. Some of the digressions. <coughs> digression is about philosophy and rhetoric. <coughs> and He's going to make a contrast between philosophy and rhetoric. Starts on page 83, 172 C.
Now, the trouble with this digression is that it goes from 172C to 177C. Yeah. And to appreciate it, I thought maybe you'd recall that particular puzzle that Socrates has on 146A. Well, that is precisely what I am puzzled about. I can't look up my own satisfaction with knowledge. The knowledge and wisdom are the same thing. Yes. Well, that's precisely what I'm puzzled about. I cannot make it to my own satisfaction with knowledge. Of this. So, uh, as I agreed, did I not? I'm going to have to read Theodorus. Barbara? No, if you don't. Well, Socrates, we, we have time at our disposal. Okay. 172C. Yeah, go ahead. And can we look? Apparently we have. And that makes me think, my friend, as I have often done before, how natural it is that those who have spent a long time in the study of philosophy appear ridiculous when they enter the courts of law as speakers. How do you mean? Those who have knocked about in courts and the like from their youth up seem to me, when compared with those who have been brought up in philosophy and similar pursuits, to be as slaves in breeding compared with free men. Hmm. In what way? In this way. The latter always have that which you just spoke of, leisure. And they talk at their leisure in peace, just as we are now taking up argument after argument already beginning a third. So can they, if, as in our case, the new one pleases them better than that in which they are engaged. And they do not care at all whether their talk is long or short, if only they attain the truth. But the men of the other sort are always in a hurry, for the water flowing through the clock water clock bridges them on. And the other party in the suit does not permit them to talk about anything they please but stands over them, exercising the law's compulsion by reading the brief, from which no deviation is allowed. This is called the affidavit. And their discourse is always about a fellow slave, and is addressed to a master who sits there holding some case or other in his hands. And the contests never run an indefinite course, but are always directed to the point at issue, and often the race is for the defendant's life. As a result of all this, the speakers become tense and shrewd. They know how to wheedle their master with words and gain his favor by act. But in their souls, they become small and warped, for they have been deprived of growth and straightforwardness and independence by the slavery they have endured, endured from their youth up. For this forces them to do crooked acts by putting a great burden of fears and dangers upon their souls while these are still tender. And since they cannot bear this burden with uprightness and truth, they turn forthwith to deceit hmm. and to requiting wrong with wrong, so that they become greatly bent and stunted. <coughs> Consequently, they pass from youth to manhood with no soundness of mind in them. But they think they have become clever and wise. So much for them, Theodorus. Shall we describe those who belong to our band, or shall we let that go and return to the argument in order to avoid abuse of that freedom and variety of discourse of which we were speaking just now? No, Socrates. Let us have your description first. As you said quite rightly, we are not the servants of the argument, which must stand and wait for the moment when we choose to pursue this or that topic to a conclusion. We're not in a court the judge's eye, nor in the theater with an audience to criticize our philosophic evolutions. Very well. That is quite appropriate, since it is your wish. And let us speak of the leaders, for why should anyone talk about the inferior philosophers? The leaders, in the first place, from their youth up, remain ignorant of the way to the Agora, do not even know where the courtroom is, or the Senate House, 
or any other public place of assembly. As for laws and decrees, they neither hear the debates upon As for laws and, de and decrees, they neither hear the debates upon them, nor see them when they are published. And the strivings of political clubs after political offices, and meetings, and banquets, and revelings with chorus girls, it never occurs to them, even in their dreams, to indulge in such things. And whether anyone in the city is of high or low birth, or what evil has been inherited by anyone from his ancestors, male or female, are matters to which they pay no more attention than to the number of pints in the sea, as the saying is. And all these things the philosopher does not even know that he does not know. For he does not keep aloof from them for the sake of gaining reputation. But really, it is only his body that has its place and home in the city. His mind, considering all these things petty and of no account, disdains them, and is born in all directions, as Pindar says, both below the earth and measuring the surface of the earth, and above the sky, studying the stars, and investiga investigating the universal nature of everything that is, each in its entirety, never lowering itself to anything close at hand. What do you mean, sir? Why, take the case of Thales, Theodore. While he was studying the stars and looking upwards, he fell into a pit, and a neat, witty, Thracian servant girl jeered at him, they say, because he was so eager to know the things in the sky that he could not see what was there before him at his very feet. The same jest applies to all who pass their lives in philosophy, for really such a man pays no attention to his next-door neighbor. He is not only ignorant of what he is doing, but he hardly knows whether he is a human being or some other kind of a creature. Mm -hmm. But what a human being is, and what is proper for such a nature to do or bear different from any other, this he inquires and exerts himself to find out. Do you understand, Theodorus, or not? Yeah, make sure you focus on that. Do you understand? That's this one, Donald. Do you spends, understand, Pete? He spends all his pains <coughs> on the question what man is and what mm -hmm. powers and properties distinguish such a nature from any other. Yours reads? Um, he, but what a human being is and what is proper for such a nature to do or bear different from any other, this he inquires and exerts himself to find out. Now, there's a long and interesting paragraph that picks up from this point. And uh, Well, I'll back you with my reading, Barbara, so long ago. And why don't you read it? Well, I, I already volunteered for Theodorus. I know, but I could do Theodorus. I'm sure I could do no, that. Not right. the way I do it. <laughs> I know, but then again... <laughs> she could do it much better, Pete. <laughs> yeah, I could do it I'm convinced. And I'm sure you could read... A lot of you people piece. think you can play like Theodorus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, when you're my age. Well, uh, what we're going to be looking at uh, in this next... in this section is, as you can imagine, we've already done part of it. Um, <coughs> and so, my friend, as I said at first on a public occasion or in private company, in a law court or anywhere else, when he is forced to talk about what lies at his feet or before his eyes, the whole rabble will join the man, the maid servants, in laughing at him. As from inexperience he walks blindly and stumbles into every pitfall. His terrible clumsiness makes him seem so stupid. He cannot engage in an exchange of abuse, for, never having made a study of anyone's peculiar weaknesses, he has no personal scandals to bring up, so as helpless he looks a fool. When people vaunt their own or other men's merits, 
His unaffected laughter makes them conspicuous, and they think he is frivolous. When a despot king is eulogized, he fancies he's hearing some keeper of swine or sheep or cow is being congratulated on the quantity of milk he squeezed out of his flock. Only he reflects that the animal that, that, that princes tend and milk is more given than sheep or cows to nurse his sullen grievance, and that a herdsman of this sort penned up in his castle is doomed by the sheer press of work to be as rude and uncultivated as the shepherd in his mountain fold. He hears of the marvelous wealth of some landlord who owns 10,000 acres or more. But that seems a small matter to one accustomed to think of the earth as a whole. When they harp about birth, some gentleman can point to seven generations of wealthy ancestors. He thinks that such commendation must come from men of problime vision, too uneducated to keep their eyes fixed on the whole or to reflect that any man has, has had countless myriads of ancestors, and among them, any number of rich men and bakers, kings and slaves, Greeks and barbarians, to pride oneself on a catalog of 25 progenitors going back to Hercules, son of Amphidion, strikes him as showing a strange pettiness of outlook. He laughs at a man who cannot rid his mind of foolish vanity by reckoning that before Amphidatron there was 25th, there was a 25th ancestor and before him a 50th whose fortunes were as luck would have it. But in all these matters, the world has the laugh of the philosopher partly because he seems arrogant, partly because of his hopeless ignorance in matters of daily life. This all happens just as you say, Socrates. <laughs> On the other hand, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> you were right about that. You can't. You know, there really has been a whole lot that he didn't right now. On the other hand, my friend, when the philosopher drags the other upwards to a height at which he may consent to drop the question, what injustice have I done to you and you to me, and to think about justice and injustice in themselves, what each is, and how they differ from one another and from anything else, or to stop quoting poetry about the happiness of kings or of men with gold in store, and think about the meaning of kingship and the whole question of human happiness and misery, what their nature is and how humanity can gain the one and escape the other. In all this field, when a small, shrewd, legal mind has to render an account, <laughs> then the situation is reversed. Now he's too dizzy from hanging at such an unaccustomed height and looking down from midair. Lost and dismayed and stammering, he will be laughed at not by maid servants or the uneducated. They'll not see what is happening, by it, but by everyone whose breeding has been the antithesis of the slaves. Such are the two characters, the Theodorus. The one is nursed in freedom and leisure, the philosopher, as you call him. He may be excused if he looks foolish or useless when faced with some menial task. If he cannot tie up bedclothes into a neat bundle or flavor a dish with spices and speech with flattery. The other is smart and the dispatch of all such services, but has not learned to wear his cloak like a gentleman, or caught the accent of discourse that will uh, rightly celebrate the true life of happiness for gods and men. If, Socrates, you could persuade all men of the truth of what you say, as you do me, there would be more peace and pure evils among, among mankind. Evils, Theodorus, can never be done away with, for the good must always have its contrary. Nor have uh, they any place in the divine world, but they must needs haunt this region of our mortal nature. That is why we should make all speed to take flight from this world to the other. And this means becoming like the divine so far as we can. And that again is to become righteous with the help of wisdom. 
But it is no such easy matter to convince men that the reasons for avoiding wickedness and seeking after goodness are not those which the world gives. The right motive is not that one should seem innocent and good, that is no better in my thinking than old wives' tales. But let us state the truth in this way. In the divine, there is no shadow of unrighteousness, only the perfection of righteousness. And nothing is more like the divine than any one of us who becomes as righteous as possible. It's here that a man shows his true spirit and power, a lack of spirit and nothingness. For to know this is wisdom and excellence of the divine sort. Not to know it is to be manifestly blind and base. All other forms of seeming power and intelligence and the rulers of society are as, as mean and vulgar as the mechanic skills and handicraft. If a man's words and deeds are unrighteous and profane, he had best not persuade himself that he is a great man because he sticks at nothing, glorifying in his shame as such men do when they fancy that others say of them. They are no fools, no useless burdens to the earth, but men of the right sort to weather the storms of public life. Let the truth be told. They are what they fancy they are not, all the more for deceiving themselves. For they are ignorant of the very thing it is most it most concerns them to know, the penalty of injustice. That is not as they imagine, stripes and death, which does not always fall on the wrong wrongdoer but a penalty that cannot be escaped. What penalty do you mean? But there are two patterns, my friend, in the unchangeable nature of things, one of divine happiness, the other of godless misery. A truth to which their folly makes them utterly blind, unaware that in doing injustice they are growing less like the one of these patterns and more like the other. The penalty they face is the life they lead, answering to the pattern they resemble. Mm. But if we tell them that, unless they rid themselves of their superior cunning, that other region which is free from all evil will not receive them after death. But here on earth they will dwell for all time in some form of life resembling their own and in the society of things as evil as themselves. All this will sound like foolishness to such strong and unscrupulous minds. Very true, Socrates. I've good reason to know it, my friend. But there's one thing about them. When you get them alone, you make them explain their objections to philosophy, then if they are men enough to face a long examination without running away, it's odd how they end by finding their own arguments unsatisfying. Somehow they, their flow of eloquence runs dry and they become as speechless as an infant. All this, however, is a digression. We must stop now and damn the flood of topics that threatens to break in and drown our original argument. With your leave, let's go backward to where we were before. To me, Socrates, such digressions are quite as agree agreeable as the argument, for they are easier for a man of my age to follow. However, if you, if you prefer, let us return to our argument. <laughs> okay. What can we use now? What do you say? How does the digression hold us? What are the proper questions and concerns of the philosopher? Let's line them up. What are they? <coughs> what is justice? What is injustice? Okay. <laughs> nature of man. He's contrasting philosophy and rhetoric, isn't he? Mm -hmm. right. um, so, is rhetoric, in this case, rhetoric without philosophy? Is that like being without the art of the philosophical midwifery? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's a poor nurture. Do they then? Do they then? <coughs> Poor nurture. They take the images for real. They're poor slaves. Nurture, right? They're slaves, and they learn how to deal in a devious manner with that, and mm. they put on all those masks, and they become crooked and bent. Uh. Mm. What? Well, it's like, God. 
crooked and bent. <laughs> right? right? Is that right? <laughs> Are you not all that so? Look here. In other words, let's go back then. All right? Look here. <clears throat> These arts, do they all depend upon knowing the nature of man? Do they? Mm -hmm. Yes. What's the quote? What, uh, what identifies it? What must you know? You must know what is man, what is his power, what powers and what abilities he has that distinguishes him from others. Is that right? Is that what we have? Do all arts <coughs> focus on the nature of man? Does it presuppose that you want to benefit man? Mm -hmm. Does each art has as its goal, and only its goal, benefiting man? Medicine, any art. Is that right? So built into it, it presupposes that you already have answered the question about the nature of man. How to bring about his development, protect him, his growth, his, right? nurturing. his nurturing, and all of his relationships. Is that right? Ah. Huh. What else do you see? Now, she picked up in her, her, her text, bearing, didn't it? And you said, by God, that word goes back to midwifery. Right? Let's go to your translation. On 121, it's 174B. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but what a human being, so the question reads in this text, but what a human being or uh, is and what is proper for such a nature to do or bear, different from any other? This he inquires and exerts himself to find out. Mm -hmm. Must be a thought, which is to bear, right. to bear throughout that kind of, that kind of a term. So remember his question way back, remember the one we had before? What is Socrates' puzzle? What is now? What is now? What is now? Yeah. There were two things there, wisdom and knowledge. I don't know about this thing, knowledge. Does he give some indication that he has? He does have an idea of wisdom in the digression? Mm -hmm. He's not puzzled about that, is he? No, he's not puzzled about that. Huh. So, right, going again. Are there two patterns? Are there two patterns? Yeah. With art, without art? Mm -hmm. Are those the two patterns? Mm -hmm. One's just and one's in just. Huh? But um, that's how he brought the, 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 the argument, wasn't it? Because he said that um, those who are wise are, um, have wisdom, and if you have wisdom, um, wise by wisdom, there's a different off knowledge. Or are not people wise in that of which they have knowledge? Mm -hmm. So right there, that well, that's how I saw he, he brought in knowledge and wisdom together. Yeah, keep reading now. Keep reading. Um, you're right. Then he says, of course. Then Sartre says, the knowledge and wisdom are the same thing. And he says, yes. It's the next line. I, I, you know. Well, it is just this that I am in doubt about. I cannot fully grasp on my What is he? He's in what? I am in doubt about. About what? About, about what knowledge really is. Yeah, or what was just agreed to. Is wisdom knowledge. Yeah, yeah. That's what he's in doubt about. But he's not in doubt about wisdom. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me, all right now, time to reflect for a moment. Can you use the digression? to throw more light on these three kinds of knowledge that he spoke of uh, in the early part that we were working on. Does it presuppose that there is something that runs through them all, this pattern? Mm -hmm. Does one, again, using all the images that we have in the digression, can we take all of that and say, hey, wait a minute now, without the R, is it likely then that's the issue of injustice, and with the art, problem of justice. Mm -hmm. Like, what good are all those arts without that? Mm -hmm. You have to know, if you know your art, must you not know the most important part? When to use it? Mm -hmm. 
Agree? All the arts depend upon your grasp of time. Time. Mm -hmm. Sure, when to reduce the pain yeah. of labor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right, to bring about the best, and so they have to have that, have to have that built-in notion of proper ordering of things to see it as a whole, so that then you can see how the particular symptom fits into the whole, and you address yourself to its particular stage. Do you know? Mm -hmm. All of those. So, Farmer, what do you think? Brian Pine. Right. Let's look at the big one on one seventy five. C, D. All right, philosopher takes him up to a height where he consents to drop what has been then his question, what injustice have I done to you and you to me? All right, and he gets him to think about justice and injustice in themselves, what each is, how they differ from one another, from one another. Right, where does stop pointing poetry about the happiness of kings or of men with gold in store? And Rather than that, think about the meaning of ruling, the art of ruling, and the whole question of human happiness and misery, what their nature is, how humanity can gain one and escape the other. Again, does that include where we're, what we just learned? These arts? Mm -hmm. Is that the way that we navigate our way through life, through these arts? If we ignore them, we run the risk of, of being foolish and So let me ask you this. Are these, in Socrates' eyes, the real philosophical questions? All right, this is really what a philosopher concerns himself with. Mm -hmm. Justice injustice in himself, what each is, how they differ from one another and from everything else, about the meaning of ruling, rulingship or kingship, the whole question of human happiness <coughs> and misery, what their nature is, how humanity can gain the one and escape the other. I show this to Taser, by the way. Pain and suffering? Yeah. I said, here's Buddhism. Buddhism. When I see Buddhism in yeah. play, yeah. yeah. is, these are the questions the philosophy asks. Right. Yeah. What did the Buddha see? Yeah. You put all kinds of stickers in the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stars right there. Yeah. Yeah. The nature of pain and suffering. Well then. <laughs> One of the, as one of the, someone said in my class, uh, how do you account for the fact that in these questions there's one that isn't there? What is knowledge? <laughs> so, I'll leave that for a moment. So, pardon? Is this an interesting way of pulling together these three arts? Going to the digression to see what can be contributed to it? Huh? Could you make a case for it? I, that looks to me as if you could very could definitely, you know, separate out the, the elements of that midwifery has in this, and the mm -hmm. that you could definitely use what we've done as mm -hmm. a structure to, to pull that information out of the digression. Yeah. So our clumsy effort may yet develop clumsy into some effort. artful product. Just because I stumbled in my speech, there's no reason to take that as a reflection <laughs> of anything but okay. the for accuracy. Uh, I was going to go somewhere else with this tonight. I was going to be a little bit but I thought tonight we'd have 
uh, shot at art and uh, attempt at pulling together something meaningful, directly meaningful. And uh, Barbara told us that a good friend of ours, who we all know, Peter Colcletes, died over at UCI, the great Greek scholar. Yeah. And so uh, I passed that thought to you as we went through this. This is the kind of work he would most enjoy. Would he not, Barbara? Yes. Right. Oh, yes. Right. And this is our tribute to him. Right? Okay. It should be 9.30. Well. What time? 9.22. Oh, all right. Sorry to hear it, he died. Heart attack? That's what I heard. Yeah. Heart attack in his home, suddenly. Yeah. That's all I heard from Sarah. Sarah told me. I was working with him. Good man. So that's why I encouraged you to do the reading tonight before you know. All right.